Hi folks, Titus Murray here from Southern Highland Structural Geology. I'm down at Saltpan Creek, southwest of Sydney, building a new 3D model of these amazing structures in the Sporksville Sandstone. Today we're going to be talking about the Minerva Field, offshore Victoria. So it was discovered in 1993 by BHP and its part partners. Um, nice gas column with about 300 BCF of gas, two discovery wells. And it's about 11 kilometres offshore, southwest of, um, of uh, Port Campbell, um, Melbourne in here. And so a useful gas resource. There are two producing wells, so the original discovery here and here, and then they put um, production wells up on the crests and tied it back um, to, to onshore. And it's brought in stream in 2002, and it's taken off stream uh, just last year in 2019. All of this theory we're just going to quickly go through um, is either in one of two uh, videos we've got, uh, one on theory of fault seal and one on how fault risk works. But the whole idea we're going to be working on is that based on the papers of Alan, where he suggests that faults are neither seals or barriers, but it's all about finding the juxtaposition of the permeable um, reservoirs or thetones and that understanding where the juxtaposition with um, impermeable seal facies are. So the whole idea of an Allen map is we have both sides of the fault represented. So this is A in the foot wall on the upthrown side, A in the foot reservoir in the hang wall and downthrown side, B in the foot wall, B in the hang wall. So we're looking at both sides of the fault so that we, we are effectively looking at all of the cross sections through there. They're useful to do and go and have a look at how to make them. So a big part of making sure we do our fault seal calculations right is getting a decent good map. And you'll see that we've had a look at a number of maps over this field. The main tool that we use is placement profiles, where we're taking a fault, we're saying it has a central maximum displacement and the displacement diminishes out to the tip. So these are contours of displacement. And if we have a foot wall, a horizon, if we have a horizon intersecting with a foot wall, it's up thrown and hang wall down thrown. Um, if we go through and take that foot wall and hang wall, we can get the separations between them and that gets us a displacement profile or a throw profile. So it's just the delta Z. Um, in here, we've marked in our theoretical profile and we'll show you in a second how we use that for the Monte Carlo simulation uh, in fault risk. So we define a stratigraphy. What we're, we're looking for a production, not looking for a production stratigraphy, we're looking for an exploration stratigraphy. We're looking at, to define where the seals are and under those seals where are reservoirs. Based around that, we may well put thief zones, which are units which we can leak into but wouldn't produce hydrocarbons. Mm. So within fault risk, what we do is we go and define um, a stratigraphy as a set of thicknesses and V-shell distributions, and then we def define our fault, and the fault is defined by distributions of length, maximum displacement, position of maximum displacement, and we can truncate the fault at either end to cope with branch lines or faults intersecting. And we'll generate 10,000 different Allen maps. Important thing, it's really important, is that we've made sure that our mathematical models are geologically, geometrically, and kinematically valid. We've made sure that we've our models make sense, both in terms of the geometry and the geology. And it's super important to do that because it's very easy to make impossible faults and then try and calculate fault seal on them. Having got a fault, the thing is then to a stochastic trap analysis. We assume a single bound of fault. We're assuming a single bound of fault block. Uh, we produce ten thousand realizations of the number of any number of the faults that are there, as well as ten thousand um, spill points and crests. And for each Allen map, for each fault, we go through and analyze it for two scenarios: for juxtaposition and for um, SGR shale gauge ratio. And each realization we go through and look in fault one. Uh, so in realization one, is it fault one or fault two that controls it? Is it the spill point? Um, is our crest such that we actually get a column? And we go through and, and check realization by realization, looking at what the hydrocarbon water contact would be. And we can do hind casting or forecasting. In this case, we're doing hind casting. We, we have a known result. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand wh wh how the faults behave given that, that result. And so we're going to do a hind casting based on juxtaposition and shale gauge ratio and compare the two. And in each case, we're comparing the oil water contact or the gas water contact in this case with the results. So we don't use the gas water contact as part of the modelling. We use it as a part of the validation or invalidation 
we're lucky with the Victorian Geologic Survey and with uh, Geoscience Australia to have a range of different maps to look at the field. We've got the original 1994 map. Um, this is as it was discovered with it having just put its second well in. Um, we've then got a 1996 map, which is much more of an exploration scale map. And then we've got the 2003 um, Minerva 4, which is effectively the, the final map we've got. So this is the final well that was drilled into it. Um, as you can see, well, I've roughly scaled them. Um, the 94 and 96 are slightly rotated because they're scanned paper copies um, and so won't be um, perfectly straight. But they're still, nonetheless, they're useful. What we've ended up using uh, through the analysis is the 1996 map to a large extent because it gives us a much better idea about what the trap looks like. You can see in here we've only got a small postage stamp view on it and certainly in terms of the drilling map, we've, we've got a really tiny postage stamp. So the 2003 map has better velocities, better processing through the crest of the structure. Whereas I really like this 1996 map because it gives me a sense of where my spill point is, I understand better where my crest is. Um, so this is the one we're going to use. We've done the calculation on all of them and the 1996 map um, produces the best result. Uh, looking at the um, 94 map, we can see we've got a, f a northern fault bounding the trap and a southern fault bounding the trap, and we've got this the fluid contact. Now, we know that these faults in here are um, communicating. Um, the throws are relatively modest. The reservoir section, is about three, as we'll see, is about 300 metres thick. So the, we can see through these. So it's upthrown, downthrown to the north, upthrown, downthrown to the south. Gas water contact known at, uh, observed at uh, 1,915. 1, We've got ourselves a spill point. See, it's hard to see the spill point on this map, whereas the big regional map, it's better, easier to see the spill point. And we've got ourselves an idea of the crest. We've gone through and dis uh, digitized um, the foot wall <coughs> of each of these and the hang wall of the images just by counting the contours. We spent a lot of time counting contours. It's a useful activity to go through. And this is the displacement profile for the southern fault. So that gets us an idea about the, the two fault geometry, key fault geometries we've got. So the stratigraphy. The single most important thing to do in any fault seal calculation is to get your stratigraphy right and to use sequence stratigraphy. We're really lucky BHP Billiton put into the um, into the government a really nice set of um, data, data sets so we can see what's going on, had to do little or no work on this. This is our 300 metre thick section, and you can see this Minerva 1A is the best uh, well we've got in that it it doesn't, um, it avoids all the faults. The 2A, which was another one, which was an appraisal well, goes through a fault, so we, we're not sure what's going on here. And then for um, 3 and 4, they came through the fault uh, to get to the, the attics of both of these um, compartments. You can see from the logs, we've got ourselves a nice um, thick Minerva sand, which is about 300 metres thick, and then we've got a labella sand underneath there, and there isn't a particularly good um, seal between the two of them. Sitting above them, and this is the thing that I'm always looking for, I'm always looking what's in my top seal. I don't just presume this is a stonking great big top seal, and, and they've done the right thing here, and they've, they've marked up, hey, look, we've got ourselves this, this little sand, um, this Napier sand, which is between 10 and 15 metres thick, and it sits there. And the critical thing is where does this sand, this Napier sand, juxtapose the main reservoir? And that's the, 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 the trick of what we're going to try and have a look at. So in fault risk, we've defined ourselves the Napier as a thief zone, about 20 metres thick, and Napier seal is about 150 metres thick. And you can see our Minerva um, formation is about 300 metres. So we've gone through and done the Allen maps and gone and done the fault risk analysis. And we ran in with both the North Fault and the South Bounding Fault. And when we go through and run in with the North Fault, <clears throat> you can see that we're getting ourselves, this is a distribution of error. So this is the difference between the juxtaposition leak point and the, um, and the observed hydrocarbon water contact. And what we're seeing in here is we've got, a juxta we've got an error of about 50, a mean error of about 58 metres. So that's a fairly big error. And that, what we're saying there is that that is leaking from the Minerva sand into the Napier sand to the north. Now, our experience is that those sorts of errors are fairly unusual. Um, so if we then start to look at this Napier sand, <clears throat> you can see again, BHP have done a really nice job of, of describing the stratigraphy. This, this is the Napier in here, and this is the top of the package that the Napier is sitting in. And you can see here's our Minerva 1 and 2, and 
as we move about 16 kilometers offshore, the whole package is thinned and, and disappears. So it may well be the Napier is non-deposited over here, or it is deposited um, or, or it pinches out. And so there's a stratigraphic component to it. But nonetheless, we're getting ourselves a 56 meter error if we have the Napier sand over the north side of the fault. If we have a look at the southern fault, and this is looking at this juxtaposition in here, you can see that we've got ourselves, a, a, we're getting a, we're um, forecasting a, or hindcasting a fluid contact at 1931 uh, um, with a standard deviation 21 meters, and our fluid contact's 1915. So you can see this is our distribution of error. We've got our cells in the order of 16 meters error, and that's looking like a more reasonable uh, sort of error in terms of this. If we were to use shale gouge ratio, then we're starting to get ourselves a 63 meter error. So uh, what we'd be saying is that, well, yes, we we do have a juxtaposition with a, um, a leak point going across the top here, but that sand thins out and or is, is totally truncated. Um, it isn't observed in the in the later wells because of faulting, and it may be that it's, it's faulted out or it's, um, it's non-deposited. But nonetheless, we're getting ourselves 16 meters of error in here if we look at leaking through the southern compartment. And so here's some of the Allen maps. So this is our P90 Allen map. The black line marks our gas water contact, the observed gas water contact, and then this is what we're getting at a fault risk. So we're seeing a 2.2 meter error in the P90 case. We're seeing a 9.7 meter error in the P50 case. And then we're seeing a 4, 42 meter error in the P10 case. So you can see what it is is the key leak, leak point is this bit of geometry in here. And this is this delta throw area that uh, James et al. and the guys at Exxon talk about. They think a lot about where these rapid changes of displacement are. So this is the most, this is the key area to understand uh, in terms of the fluid contacts. So we've got a fairly big data set uh, of hundreds of cases, uh, again, published in the Jolsock paper. Um, and we start to get concerned when we're getting outside of this 15, 20 meter error zone. If we're starting to get out in here, we've, we, we, these are unusual errors. So that's why we would pick that the, um, the, the juxtaposition across the northern fault um, uh, is either going into a stratigraphic system or it's non deposit a stratigraphic trap or is non-deposited because we're getting right in there. And you can see that our Minerva case sits pretty much within our the, within our safety zone. It's coming in at that 16 metres, so between 20 and zero metre error. Um, so in general, we're looking to try and understand how we can get systems uh, through primary exposition that make sense in terms of their depositional environment and um, their structure. So in conclusion, <clears throat> you know, we'd sit there and say, well, if juxtaposition works, why use SGR? Uh, this is a case from uh, which we'll hope to do a virtual field trip, which is right under the Australian Parliament um, at State Circle in Canberra. And you can see the complexity in the fault zone. We've got a huge amount of complexity in there. You know, if we're taking that complexity, let's have a look at where the fluid contact are and let's not try and make a complicated solution for an uncertain uh, problem. Um, and what we're seeing is the key controls on fluid contact are the interplay between displacement and stratigraphic seals. Um, again, this is stuff from the Jolsock paper and that we go through in the theory slides uh, in the Coralina field where it's a juxtaposition of a thief zone against the main Coralina reservoir that gets us a really good match with the fluid contact. Faults fundamentally have uncertainty and complexity. It's vital to look at all of the data. We looked at all the maps and we started looking at the linkages of them. Um, and it's important to sit there and use stochastic modeling. You can't use the single one wrong answer. We've ended up using outcroppies study, outcrop studies a lot to show holes in fault rock and to understand that if you've got fault holes in fault rock, you're going to leak across those juxtapositions. Um, we'll go and do a talk about this one soon. This is some of the stuff from Miri and Sarawak. We've got a whole set of um, images we've collected and videos so you can get to a bit of a virtual trip, field trip to Miri. Holes in fault rock will mean that juxtaposition, that means that the shale gouge ratio tools won't work. And I guess the main thing is, and this is what a bit about the work we're doing, is um, we're putting out the case study. So you can see, you know, 
I'll make mistakes. <laughs> I make mistakes all the time. But by sharing what we're doing, you'll get a better idea about how the systems do and don't work. And so, you know, if you have a look back through the literature, if membrane seals work so well, where are the case studies and where are the replications of them? Uh, this replication of science is a really important thing. Hey folks, I hope you enjoyed the Minerva field. We'll be bringing you more great outcrops, hopefully less wet, and more case studies from around the world. Cheers, bye.